Hello, everybody. Welcome to back to History Valley Podcast. Today, Professor James Tabor, and today we're going to be talking about his book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about Paul, his views, the differences between Paul's views and what's in the Gospels as well, what Paul means by paradise, and contrasting that from what the Gospels and Revelation means from paradise. So my first question for you today is, what did you mean by Paul didn't derive his authority as apostle from the inspiration of the present, but from the events in the past. And what do you mean? And I guess I need clarification. You mean the inspiration yeah. of yeah. what present? I do think he's continually receiving revelations. Um, mm. So if you're talking about his present, yes. um, he, he seems to mainly delineate between an initial experience which he had uh it's usually called his conversion experience uh, mm. lots of historians of religion feel that term is mean to turn in that sense he'd be okay with it but he would probably want to claim <clears throat> almost like messianic jews do today i didn't change religion i updated you know the 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 real revelation of Sinai and Moses and the prophets and so forth. That is, he would want to say that he remains a Jew, but his initial experience he of course describes uh, as a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, I take that genitive to mean both that it's revealing Jesus to him because he has another phrase when it pleased god to reveal his son to me or in me so it's a revelation about jesus christ the messiah as he calls him but it's also a revelation from christ he uses phrases in his letters like i receive from the lord hmm. and whenever he uses lord in that kind of context he means jesus he calls him the curios, the Lord, the boss, the master. So that's initial. You would get that mainly in Galatians 1. And he's very definitive about it. He dates it precisely. And then he says, after three years, I did this. And after 14 years, I did that. So he's clearly remembering back on that initial experience. And the other place would be in 1 Corinthians nine where he likens his experience of jesus seeing jesus he says i've seen the lord uh mm -hmm. just like peter and james and he names other apostles and then of course the mo mo best known one is first corinthians 15 where he gives this list a kind of a rundown of this i like to call it the sightings of jesus appearances just i don't think is the right word but uh, people that cited Jesus, they said, I saw him, you know, did you see him? I, yeah, I saw him. And that's in, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, last of all, uh, he appeared to me. So I had my sighting and he equates that. So that would be the past I think you're referring to. Hmm. And that's where he gets his authority but I'm not sure where that quotation is in the book, but it probably has a certain context. I don't think it means that he doesn't think that subsequent revelations are insignificant in any way or even inferior. And that brings us to the passage in 2 Corinthians 10 that the entire book is really written about. Uh, I take those verses where Paul recounts uh, what I take to be his own personal ascent to paradise. And he calls it, uh, he uses a compounded double verb, which means something like the super abundant, uh, what, beyond revelation, revelations, meaning almost like a double superabundant. And he said that 
because he's had more, he, he's essentially saying, I'm getting more than anybody else. This is so heightened what I am receiving as revelation. This would be much later in the 50s CE when he writes Second mm. Corinthians. He says, I was given this uh, thorn in the flesh. Let's save that for later if you want to talk about it. You know, people get all interested in that sort of thing. What was his thorn in the flesh? But <laughs> it, he, the point there is that because of the super, super overabundance of revelations that I got, implying that he's been given things that no one else has been given. But I was probably trying to make the point that the authority for his message is essentially coming from that initial experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's the context. Uh, we could check if you have the page number, but it's probably yeah. not that essential. Uh, the point would be that Paul claims to be talking to Jesus, mm -hmm. and it's conversational. For example, when he talks about the Last Supper, he calls it, he says, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he took the cup and so forth. He doesn't call it Passover. He says on the night he was betrayed. That's 1 Corinthians 11. He prefaces that by saying, I received this from the Lord. Now, I understand that to mean, when he uses that special phrase, it's, it's a verb, uh, to receive in, in this context means to have something passed on to you officially. Hmm. So, otherwise, I think he would say, I received it from those who were, you know, in the faith before me, like James or Peter. But then even in the passage we're talking about, 2 Corinthians 10, Paul's ascent to paradise, he says, I asked Jesus three times to take away this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was. And three times I got the same answer. So you see how he's simply asking, like we're having a conversation right now. This is the kind of intimacy Paul claimed. There are other places in his letters where he makes this either claim or implication. He might be wanting to make a trip and then he'll get the word, no, no, that's not, you know, you don't need to make those plans yet or you need to let, delay this or that. So he is a uh, shaman kind of figure in the in terms of history of religions. You've studied shamanism. He would be a shamanistic figure who is negotiating revelations back and forth with the one he believes is the highest cosmic power next to God the Father, who's the creator, and that's Jesus of Nazareth, who was once a human, and he now believes he's been exalted to heaven. So he's in touch with him, and he's very insistent on saying that what he's received and what he's passing on is not from men, he says, or of men, or anything other than a revelation from Jesus Christ. So he's claiming something absolutely direct and immediate, which is a claim we don't really get in a first-person way in some of our other New Testament writings. For example, Luke, uh, the author of Luke, whether he was Luke or not is a question. Most scholars don't think it was written by the Luke mentioned by Paul. But anyway, whoever wrote it, that person doesn't say, I was suddenly taken up in the spirit and I received a revelation. Mark doesn't start that way. Mark doesn't even use the first person. Matthew doesn't start that way. Uh, John does use the plural we. You know, what we have received, we're passing on to you. But it's not a first person letter like this so that's i think what i probably had in mind when i made that point hmm. to take this uh as an ultimate revelation that came years after the initial revelation how many years i'm not sure because the 14 years that he dates this to is a kind of a floating period. Roughly, it seems to go back to around 40 CE. Uh, 
Hmm. Uh, some people have tried to make it his conversion experience, so-called, putting that in air quotes, conversion. You know, the time when he first encountered this voice of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, my understanding of it is that for him, it was like some kind of a, something akin to a blinding light in a voice. Uh, that's what's reported in the book of Acts, but that's not why I say that. It's interesting that Acts also reports that. But it's so different from the disciples running around Jerusalem, encountering a flesh and bone corpse revived, like in the Gospel of Luke or John, examining the wounds, because Paul said, I can't even tell you what the body of Jesus is like. Hmm. It's glorified. It's beyond description. It's beyond imagination. So what did he see? I, I'm not going to go there yet because I know you're going to get to it. But uh, <laughs> I think what he saw, he says, I can't tell you. It's not. I'm not allowed to tell you. Hmm. But that doesn't mean we can't guess, Jacob. So we'll guess as we go along. But anyway, with your first question, that's where I would start. This this is probably not his initial experience. I don't think the chronology quite lines up. And I should also do with the idea that he says, I've, I've got the Greek text here. It might help for me just, I won't read it in Greek, but <laughs> it's written in two parts. It's a doublet, which is very mm. common in biblical writing. And a lot of people don't realize it's a doublet so hmm. it i'll give you the very literal translation i'm reading right from the greek exactly as it's written okay so here here we go he says i knew that's in the perfect tense so he's talking about you know in the past i knew a man in christ a uh for more than 14 years ago so not exactly 14 but he says pro you know more than 14 years ago, like I would be telling you, you know, it's more than 15 years ago when I did this or that. You're not giving an exact date. Uh, whether in body, I don't know. Whether out of the body, I don't know. So I knew and now I don't know. Uh, he was, but God knows. So he's saying whatever it was, it was a God experience. And this one, this man that I knew, was caught up, literally. It's arpazo, which means to be, in mm. English, people talk about a rapture, you know, taken up. It's very similar to what he describes in 1 Thessalonians 4. Remember about the dead in Christ will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He was caught up into the third heaven. So that's the first stanza you might say and here's the second whether you can line these up they might be parallel and i know that this man now line one before it said i know a man now i know now i know that this man whether in body or whether without the body so instead of saying ectos out of the body he says or without the body so he changes the preposition outside the body it means almost the same thing you know out of body experiences we talk about but out of body and without the body is not exactly the same but he says he doesn't know but god knows and that this one heard oh i'm sorry and this one was caught up into paradise so that's the parallel so those are your two parallels. And then at the end, you get a, a conclusion, not repeated twice. So you see how the first part is repeated each time twice. The first stanza, second stanza, perfect parallel. So he's really constructed this in terms of a literary uh, style. And then he says, and this one heard unutterable words. That word, arita, in the plural, could mean there's no way, Jacob, I can tell you what I saw any more than I could tell a blind person what color is like. I just, mm -hmm. I can't do it. It's impossible. So it could be that. 
or it could be unutterable, which I lean towards, uh, may, or maybe both, but it could mean also forbidden, like do not say this. And we get that, as you know, from reading the book. I give all these other ascent to heaven texts throughout antiquity, Hellenistic antiquity. We have dozens of them. And this is one of the motifs that we find often. This is secret. What you're learning, what you're seeing, what you're experiences, experiencing is uh, private. It's the word mystery. And uh, he says it's, it's not lawful for a man to uh, speak about. And that seems to be the kind of prohibition. So that gives you the basic text that we're talking about. But he does say that this was so extraordinary that it would cause him to be maybe proud or boastful or feel that he was mainly, maybe the main, not mainly, he was maybe the main person in the cosmos or God is revealing this to him in such a unique and extraordinary way. That seems to be what he apply, implies, that Satan, now he, Paul talks about Satan quite a bit. You know, he talks about, I'm gonna make a trip to Corinth, but Satan hindered me, or it's always a warning about Satan. So he takes Satan as a very concrete, real entity, a, a being that is able to send him some kind of affliction which he refers to metaphorically as a thorn in the flesh. And that particular, it's maybe like a burr under the saddle kind of idea, hmm. but I think it's actually more than that uh, because a thorn in the flesh really implies that you've been pierced and you've got to put up with the pain and he asked God to remove it. But he calls it an angelos, a messenger of Satan, a messenger. Now, normally, if we read that anywhere else, Satan has his angels, right? His messengers in the New Testament, as well as perhaps the Hebrew Bible. It's not so clear in the Hebrew Bible. Maybe in the book of Daniel which is a later book and you get some of this mythology, but uh, I would tend to go with what we would normally think if we read about a Angelou Satan, an angel of Satan, that's the kind of thing that we call a demon, you know, today. Hmm. Not in the ancient Greek platonic sense, but like an evil spirit, a messenger uh, of Satan. So that was allowed or permitted this entity to bother him. Now, what people often say, because it says in the flesh, that it was manifested in some kind of a bodily affliction. And then you come up with like, oh, my goodness. I think in the book I footnote, uh, there have been over 50 suggestions uh, typically, it would be things like Paul had epilepsy or Paul was extremely nearsighted. You remember the character Mr. Magoo from childhood, you know, where the cartoon character can't really see and he keeps stumbling mm -hmm. around. Uh, the reason people have suggested that kind of thing is because he does refer to when he writes his letter to the Galatians, he talks about I... When I first came to you, you bore with my bodily affliction that was like a burden to you. So something maybe that others have suggested, maybe his face was disfigured. So when you looked at him, you kind of, you know, turned away because you didn't want, you know, to expose him or whatever. It's just like somebody... But that wouldn't sound like something that a recent, you know, emissary of Satan would inflict him with. Some people have talked about migraine headaches. I mean, people basically just guess. Um, if I had to guess, and I don't want to offend or shock anybody here, 
I would say it's probably some kind of sexual temptation. Hmm. He's trying to live a, a celibate life. And we know from diaries and other accounts of monks later in early Christianity uh, that have dreams and they feel that demonic forces are presenting them with sexual temptations. It could be something like that. Uh, so he would uh, have maybe thoughts that he couldn't control. And that could be seen as a thorn in the flesh because he uses the word flesh elsewhere to mean, you know, sexual desire, desires of the flesh and so forth. One indication of that would be in Romans 7 when he says, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, I do. And then he says, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he talks about how he, with his mind, serves God and Christ or Jesus. But with his flesh, he lusts. He uses the word uh, covet, which is the old English. You know, you should not covet your neighbor's wife or whatever. But again, I don't know what it is. Is it, is it sexual temptation? Is it a physical ailment or whatever? And I don't think we're going to know. But our point here is that he has that intimacy that he would say, he says, I asked the Lord three times. This is very concrete, you know? It's like if you're talking to me about somebody and I say, you know, I've spoken to him, Jacob, three different times and I get the same answer. I'm not talking about a vague impression or a, a kind of a hunch. I'm saying I spoke to this person. Three times, I tell you how many times. So that gives you a feeling of what Paul is claiming. Uh, and that's an ongoing thing. He receives words and revelations from Jesus. This is not unknown by far in the history of religions or even the history today, where people claim to receive words from the Lord. It's actually one of the spiritual gifts mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians. You know, people get a word from the Lord. And he apparently certainly claimed to have such a gift. Hmm. So you go ahead because you know me, I can just talk <laughs> forever. <laughs> but you might have some more specific things to come back to and we can move ahead the way you wish. Well, what I wanted to ask you is, is the 14 years in, could it, is it possible that the 14 years in 2 Corinthians is connected to the 14 years in Galatians? Or do you think those are two different sets of 14 years? Um, as I say in the book, um, I think they're probably different. There mm -hmm. have been people who have tried to argue this I think John Knox was one of the people who argued it, a uh, Pauline scholar, and later changed his mind, decided it isn't going to work. So much depends on how you set up the chronology. Hmm. And frankly, without the book of Acts and Galileo's uh, inscription that we have and correlating that with the Corinthian visit and so forth, you know, we don't really know. Uh, you notice how people, even the date of the crucifixion, the date of the birth of Jesus, you'll read very substantial proposals on the birth of Jesus from 7 BCE down to 2 BCE. And you'll read uh, accounts of the crucifixion, some people as early as 27 or 28. Mm -hmm. CE all the way down to 36 sometimes so much of it depends on your presuppositions hmm. but my sense it, it I would almost like that to work out because it seems so definite like like something you would remember you know I'll never forget the time 14 years ago 
or about 14 years ago, he says here, when I had this revelation. And if that was his initial encounter with Jesus, that would be really fascinating to have that chronology correlate. Uh, so it probably depends on how fluid your, think of the timeline as a kind of a sliding scale. So if you put it here, it won't work. But maybe if you move it here, it could work. But then if you move it here, it won't work. So you have to ask, where do you get the sliding scale? You know, we've got a few dates here and there. Uh, sometimes they're very broad. But Paul, uh, you know, he'll say honor Caesar, but he doesn't say Caesar's Nero. We're pretty sure Caesar was Nero when he says that. But, you yeah. know, how would we prove it? Because the reign of Claudius, basically from Caligula to Claudius to Nero, you know, there's just, even though Claudius is more stable than Nero and Caligula, there's just a lot of play in terms of trying to, you know, pin down a reference to the emperor, which he does mention a couple of times. Same, time, same thing when he's in prison. You know, he talks about in Philippians being in prison. And some people think that's not even wrong, that that's Caesarea. That's a very good hmm. possibility. Frankly, there's so much we don't know. And what usually happens in Sunday school and churches and even in academic classes is people take the standard view that is generally agreed on by many academics and they just work with it. And if you go with that, uh, this would be earlier than 40. Let's say 2 Corinthians written in 54, 55, right in there. Mm. This would be earlier than that. Um, I mean, the, con the con so-called conversion would be earlier than that. But, I mean, it, you got to admit it is remarkable that the same period is named, you know, and mentioned very specifically. You know, why 14 years? Mm. But I have notes on that, by the way. The book has a lot of footnotes. So I put them at the end of the chapters. But for people who want to really dig in, I have notes on those who have argued one way or the other. And you, you can go and, and study it more yourself. Almost everything in the book is footnoted. Mm. You know, there are mm. hundreds and hundreds of footnotes. Or I sitting in notes the way I had it printed. Mm -hmm. I didn't put them at the bottom of the page. You were bringing up earlier about um, Paul being very serious about his celibacy. And the epistle to Philemon, he says, he mentions Onesimus, whom he says was born in his chains. What did he mean by that? Begotten in his chains. And you're thinking that Onesimus, the slave, yeah. That yeah, that might yeah. not mean uh, that he's a slave, or what What are you thinking there? Well, I was curious what he meant by, like, uh, this slave was was uh, begotten uh, by Paul in his chains. Did he adopt him as his son or something? Oh, I see what you mean. Like, he could be his father or something? I was just wondering what you thought of that. I, I would not. I haven't thought of it really. I, I have never taken it that way. Hmm. I will say this, though, about his celibacy. I think it's likely, given his former background hmm. as a Pharisee in it, within Judaism, as he claims in Philippians and here in Second Corinthians, he gives his um, CV, you might say, you know, I was the tribe of Benjamin, I was this, I was that. <clears throat> it's very likely that he was married and the celibacy was something he took on with his abandoning the former school of Judaism, the Pharisees, which he was part of. Um, and the reason I would suggest that, again, so much is speculation, and I admit that. But I try to speculate in the direction of something with an argument, you know, and here would be the argument. Whenever you read his 
treatment of celibacy. It's in 1 Corinthians 7. It's an entire chapter. It's a, what I call an apocalyptic celibacy, a circumstantial celibacy. What he says is the time, the appointed time of the end has grown very near. So it's very similar to what Jesus is recorded to have said in the synoptic apocalypse, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, where he says, woe to those who are pregnant or nursing in that day. It's not a statement against pregnancy or nursing, but it's a advice that that would not be a good time to have a child. If all of Judea is falling apart and the Romans are invading, don't plan your family. So if you go to 1 Corinthians 7, it's similar advice. He's telling the group at Corinth, you know, it's really virtuous not to touch a woman. Just stay single. Live the single life. There's a lot of virtue in that. And then he goes on to say, I don't demand it, and I don't want to cause anybody to fall into immorality trying to do it if they can't. But it's good, and it's one of the most tangled chapters because he, it, it goes something like this. Uh, it's good not to be with a woman, but if you have to, go ahead. But I hope you don't, and it'd be better if you didn't. But if you do, it's okay, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I still recommend that you don't. But if you do, I mean, it sort of goes along like that. It's, it's really fun to read in that sense. But at one point he says, there is a circumstance, and it's just odd that he would bring this up. He says, let's say somebody is a, a believer. Uh, this is kind of Qumran talk. I know modern Christians talk about a believer, but it means part of the group, the Yachad, the Qumran group, meaning you're in, you're in the Christ community. He calls it being in Christ. He said, let's say somebody who's in Christ, a believer, has a husband or wife that says, I'm leaving. And they're not a believer. They're not in the community. I'm, I'm going. I'm not staying with you. You picture something like this crazy religion you've taken up, denying, you know, if we think about it in Corinth, you know, you're not going to the temple of Athena anymore. You're, you know, you. You don't want us to raise our children, you know, to be devoted to the gods of Rome and Greece. You know, you've taken up this crazy Jewish God and you even believe that a Jew is now in heaven and all this kind of stuff. You see how somebody would say, you know, almost like an annulment, like I'm out of here. And Paul says, uh, if that happens, a brother or sister is not bound in such a case. Meaning, you. even though marriage is not to be dissolved between believers, Jesus taught that, no divorce within the community. But if a non-believer leaves, let him go. Okay, he could just be thinking of circumstances, but I can't help thinking for this reason, that he as a person studying in Jerusalem, as he says, and uh, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees and so forth, being married is simply so much a part of the culture that young men in this culture at this time, we know from a variety of Jewish sources, would be married. And especially if you're going to be a quote rabbi and i'm not using that in the fully developed modern sense but you know you you've been trained to be a leader and a and a scholar in the religion and traditions of that school you would be married people are married and i think uh he could be re referring to his own experience that he was left again i'm speculating but hmm. um if so, that would mean that he, as he says, I've suffered the loss of all things, you know, in order to do what I'm doing. So the celibacy is a challenge for him, I think, like 
for any person. Some people have suggested that he's gay. Others would just go with the heterosexual, but either way, uh, I don't see any reason to think he's gay from anything that he says in his letters. But he uh, does talk a lot about the flesh and how it wars against the spirit to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So to me, sexuality is the most likely thing that he's talking about with his thorn in the flesh, just to come full circle. Hmm. You said in the book that Paul's model is Jesus. So the language he applies to himself from Isaiah regarding suffering, he may well also have applied to Jesus. He is in turn the model for the community. So even if he speaks of his suffering for them, they too are to learn to follow him in this regard. Are you suggesting here that Paul compared himself and Jesus to Isaiah's suffering servant? Yeah, but not in the singular way that there's one suffering servant. The suffering servant in Isaiah is a group that are listening to God and taking up the cause, and it runs through this section of Isaiah 40. Actually, some some scholars think there are three Isaiahs, so this would be second Isaiah, not third. And uh, that group is addressed and identified a number of times as the ones who have the law in their heart and so forth, and they're following God. And they're being uh, opposed and persecuted by their fellow community. And so if you remember in the four so-called suffering servant hymns or psalms that are found in the book of Isaiah, starting with chapter 42 on through 53, um, I think Paul appropriates one of those more directly to himself. And that's what I argue in the book. And that's Isaiah 49. Hmm. And the reason is that figure is told that he has to go to not just the Jews, but also to the nations. And Paul talks about that, how he goes to the Jew first and then to, he calls it the Greek, meaning the non-Jew. And he talks about his suffering and that he bears in the in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus and that sort of thing. They have a whole exposition on that. If you want to make it blatant, I would say he thinks he's a second Christ, but I'm willing to put a small C with that if it shocks anybody. He doesn't think he's Jesus. But remember when the Gospels do quote the suffering servant material in the mouth of Jesus. Jesus doesn't just say, I'm that guy taking up my cross. What does he say? And if anyone would follow me, right, let him also deny himself and take up the cross. So the suffering servant idealization that comes from those hymns is not just about the central figure that would be Jesus for the Jews. He says in his letter, Jesus Christ, he calls him, was sent to the circumcision. I'm sent to the uncircumcision. Well, if you look at Isaiah 42 and 49 and 51 and 53, you'll see one of the figures is going to his own people, and they would understand that to be Jesus, and the other is going to the world. And actually, by going to the world, he thinks he's assisting in bringing together all of Israel, which would include the scattered, I don't like calling them lost tribes because that's not even a term used in the Bible, but the scattered tribes, uh, the remnant of Israel has been scattered throughout the nations. And Paul, as he preaches, believes that they're going to be brought back like a harvest. Hmm. 
and uh, but also Gentiles as well, non-Jews as well. So mm -hmm. he, uh, I think he does think of himself. He says, I'm going to be poured out on the sacrificial altar. That's a term for pouring out blood. He's talking about himself. That's in Philippians when he's thinking of his death. So he does, uh, I think, have a more general view of atonement. Like, follow me as I follow Christ. So he believes, and he, he talks then about his sufferings and how they're redemptive. And uh, he names all of his sufferings in this very letter, 2 Corinthians, which is several letters, but in the section 10 through 13, he names all of his sufferings. So I do think he, it, it's a, let me put it this way. It's a very heady thing for anybody, and many have done it throughout history, to be reading in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets, and read about a figure that seems to be described, a prophetic figure, and to say, I think that's me. I think that's me. I think I'm being prophesied here. Now, that is a very, very, you know, crazy thing to do. Most psychologists would say, yeah, we, we've got you listed in the diagnosis book of mental illnesses. You know, <laughs> it's a, a narcissistic <laughs> kind of problem that you have thinking you're the center of the cosmos. But that's modern psychology. That's not the ancient world. But if somebody finds themselves in, himself or herself in the text, then that text can be very instructive to them because they think that they're getting a message through the written scriptures that it directly applies to them. It'd be similar to the way someone might read one of the Psalms in the Hebrew Bible. And it would just seem to fit them so well that they would almost identify with it, you know, as being about them, even if it's also about David or somebody else. But this is even more if it's prophetic, because these prophetic figures are often supposed to do certain things. In this case, Isaiah 49, he's supposed to go to the nations and gather them to belief in Jesus as the Christ. And he reads it and he thinks, that's me. Now, the reason I would credit him with that kind of, uh, I don't want to call it egotism, but obviously, diagnostically, it's pretty egotistic to think you're mentioned in a text like that, is what he says in Galatians. He says, I was called for my mission to the Gentiles in my mother's womb. Okay, now, if you're just given a commission or a job or a mission to carry out and you think God wants you to go do this, that, or the other, you would never say, while I was developing in my mother's womb, I was already being prepared for what I am destined to do. This is a very high view of the individual role that you think you have. And I think an analyst would be very interested in that subject. Like, oh, really? So you actually do believe that you, before you're even born, were already destined to take the message to the whole world. Now remember, unless the message goes to the whole world, the end can't come. So if you put that with the mission, once Jesus has gone to heaven and been glorified at the right hand of God, which Paul believes, who's the most important person on earth in terms of facilitating and carrying out the final days of human history, if not Paul. 
And he does believe that about himself. Is James doing it? Is Peter doing it? Is John doing it, even though they're the pillars of the church in Jerusalem? Not as far as we know. They're pretty much maintaining a certain form of Nazarene faith centered in Jerusalem. And Paul is going out into the diaspora. And as he says in Romans 9, 10, and 11, as you know, that those critical chapters that Jason Staples has written about, you know, I don't know if you've ever had him on, but he would. I did once. He really is uh, coming out with his new book now. He, mm. He's got uh, The Ideal of Israel is out. The Idea of Israel, which is a big, thick book, but he's got yeah, that, his yeah. other book out. Yeah. And uh, I think he, I think Jason's correct to read those chapters as Paul believes that uh, the parousia, the arrival of Jesus, is being held back until he finishes his mission. And then he says, hmm. when that happens, when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, well, who's bringing about the fullness of the Gentiles? He tells you in that very book that that's his job. So not only was he chosen before he was born, according to him, but it's a job that's unique in history. Basically, along with Jesus, who went to the Israelite world, or the Jewish people, as it's usually spoken of um, in the text, he is going to the wider world. So, yeah, I think his self-understanding is very high, very developed. And, you know, we already talked, Jacob, about my other book, uh, Paul and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I made to you is that people who love Paul don't mind me saying any of what I just said, because they would agree with it. Say, yes, absolutely. Paul's the guy that brought in the fullness of time, you know. And then that would lead to the church or whatever their view of history is. And those who don't like Paul, who think Paul's just a crazy, lunatic, delusional, egomaniac, would also go, see, look at this crazy stuff he claims. Only somebody who's lost his mind could believe such things about themselves. So, as I told you when we talked about the book, in both these books, my endeavor is to get Paul right. I hope I did. And that way, I feel like I'm serving as an academic, as a scholar, the task of expository uh, analysis that would be even-handed whether you like the guy and think he's crazy or you think he's the most inspired guy ever in history. But is there any doubt that Paul's letters now, today, are essentially Christianity? I mean, it's where everybody goes for almost everything. We don't need Jesus for, you know, love your neighbor, help the poor, don't be a hypocrite when you pray, don't give money to be seen of men. These are all standard things taught within any spiritual tradition I know of. The Buddha taught these. Every good rabbi taught these, Gamaliel, Hillel, right? This is just spiritual tradition. But this specific stuff Paul is teaching goes way beyond, say, what you'd find, say, in the book of James. The book of James would be an example of taking the teaching of Jesus and continuing it on in that vein, you know, ethical maxims, exhortations, uh, if a rich, if a poor guy comes into your synagogue, don't sit him in the back and honor the rich. Very similar to what Jesus taught. Now, Paul, of course, believes all of that too. But his mission is not to offer standard Jewish or standard spiritual ethics of how one human being should treat another human being. That's not his mission. And he says that. He says, my mission is to give a message that's never been given before. 
and is now being made known. He calls it a mystery that's now being made known to the, to the children of men, he calls it, uh, to human beings. Now being made known that wasn't known in the past. He thinks he has received the final revelation. Mm. And as you know, in the book, that first chapter is a tough one. Uh, because I take you through his entire mission and message. The two M's, mission and message. His apostolic mission and his unique message. And they coalesce together like this, hand in glove. And it's not the standard evangelical message, which is Christ died for your sins. You need to repent of your sins. Don't rely on works. Trust in Christ, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. That's not his standard mission or message. That's pretty widespread throughout most uh, levels of Christianity in the early period, you know, the death of Jesus and so forth, as some kind of sacrifice of atonement. But that's not the new revelation, you see. That he could have gotten from say Peter. He said he stayed with Peter and Peter, we don't know if Peter wrote First Peter, but in First Peter you have similar teachings about, you know, the suffering of, and death of Jesus being, having atoning power. But mm. what is unique to Paul is his idea that God is creating first through Jesus and finally, through the whole cosmos, a new genus or species of being, I think genus is the better term, they're called children of God, offspring of God, and they are going to be immortalized, glorified, and receive the same glory and power that Jesus received because he's the firstborn of a whole family that is going to follow. Now that is what he calls the mystery. There's a place, I think it's in Philippians, where he says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Glory is the key word. Doxazo in Greek. Doxa. But when Paul says glory, he means in the tears of the universe, starting with the earthly all the way up to the heavenly and then angels and then jesus christ and then god the father what level will you be on once you achieve this glorified status he very plainly says right it'll be you'll have the same level as jesus himself he's just the older brother and this is his core messages I show in the book. I mean, I go through that very thoroughly. And that, uh, the difference between the two books is this is a very academic book with lots of footnotes and documentation and detailed citation. It's not a breeze to read unless you're really into this stuff. But if you're really into Paul, it's a pleasure to read. I think you'll find it uh, for Paul, uh, either devotees or just Paul, people wanting to really get Paul straight. Believe it or not, this book could be a page turner because I take you through page after page of things that, as far as I know, nobody's really put together in this way. The book is kind of unique. Hmm. And I pin it all on and, and take it all back to his ascent to paradise. I, I have, whatever you're ready, I'll make the revelation, <laughs> but I have an idea <laughs> of what he might have experienced. Hmm. The kind of scene described in 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5, the man living with his father's wife is to be delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What is this supposed to mean? Is it trying to say a man live 
cheating uh, hold on it's, it's like is it, is it saying like the man living of his father's wife does it mean to say the the wife of the father if she cheats with the man but the son he's to be delivered to satan for destruction of the flesh i think what it's implying um i you know we don't know the circumstances hmm. but it probably is implying um within judaism there are these forbidden degrees of marriage who can you marry who can you not marry it's a big subject of controversy and one of the things mentioned it's in the book of leviticus and it's specified is you can't marry your father's wife now that's not talking about your mother obviously right um uh, you have to try to construct some circumstances that would fit. The idea is, and what I usually tell my students, let's imagine the best case scenario. Like that if we went on the Jerry Springer show, half the audience would go, hey, what's wrong with that? And the rest would, oh, that's sick. So let's say your father, biological father, obviously is older than you. Your mother has passed away. We'll make it. Let's don't let anybody still be living. <laughs> and uh, your father and his new wife, who's not your mother, they get married. So it's sort of like your stepmother, but say you're grown. So, you know, it's not really like stepmother in the household. Spread the age out a little bit. I'm just supposing here, but where you can imagine it. And so let's say the woman is younger and maybe getting pretty close to the age of the son. You know, this happens. Like a widower marries uh, a younger woman. And let's say then that he dies. The reason I want to say die is you don't want to get in a divorce. Like, oh, was it okay to divorce? Is that the problem? Let's just say he dies. He's older. Well, now the woman's free. She's not married anymore, right? And you guys are kind of close to the same age. So what would be wrong with getting married? So if we take this to the Jerry Springer show, so to speak, you'll have half the population going, come on. They're the same age. They love each other. Nobody's bound by anything as far as previous marriages. Everybody involved is dead. Of course they can get married. And Paul goes, are you kidding me? That is the sickest thing I've ever heard in my life. You cannot be with the woman that your father was with. You go, well, why? And the answer in the Hebrew Bible, because it's sick. <laughs> it's literally a kind of a, it's this incest idea. Like what's wrong with having sex with your sister? The same kind of idea, right? Or even your stepsister. Well, some people would say, well, if it's not a biological relationship, maybe it's okay. But in some cultures, brother-sister marriage has been allowed. So these things have to do with, you know, moral sensitivities that develop within a culture. So Paul is saying, you know, I don't even know in Roman custom that this would be allowed but you certainly should know better than this and so the guy is refusing to separate apparently the guy has been told you can't do this and he's saying oh, sorry i don't agree uh and uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, get married or whatever or maybe he's already slept with her so it's much more than just having sex because he says living with you know, and even if they got married, I don't think he would think it was okay. But what's interesting about it to me, and this is why I mentioned in the book, is he says, I want you to gather together. And when the spirit of the Lord is present. So this is like, you know, I don't want to offend anybody here. But people today call this channeling or a seance, right? Hmm. Like a person who's gone, but their spirit is present. And my spirit is present. Well, he's still living. 
So he's projecting his own spirit. It's a formal kind of uh, almost like trial of sorts in which this person is officially delivered. We don't know the ceremony, but I imagine it would, would be something like witnesses are called. The person is allowed to speak and he's told that this is not allowed and he must separate from this woman because it's a, it's considered sexual immorality. And if he says, uh, yeah, you're right, I'll do it, then fine. But if he doesn't, then you officially have a, some kind of ceremony that would be like unbaptizing you, so to speak, de-baptism. Like just as baptism brought you into the community, now we are putting you back out. And if you think of the world as a sphere, like picture a circle on a page, and then a smaller circle with all the people that are part of the Christian community, those truly in Christ, Paul calls it the body of Christ, you're being put out back into the world. Well, Satan can just have at it with you. And remember, uh, people in this time, Paul included, Jesus included, they believe some really bad things can happen to you if Satan just has his way with you. You know, they, they credit disease and all kinds of bad circumstances to uh, the buffeting of Satan. So this is not a group that is operating by some kind of 20th century or 21st century secular uh, worldview. They believe the universe is thick with all kinds of uh, forces and angels and principalities and powers that are clustered all around, ready to get you. But if you're in the body of Christ, you're protected. But he does this, he says, because he hopes that the person will come to his senses. And by the time the day of the Lord comes, which I think he thinks is going to be very soon. And when I say very soon, I think he, months or years at the most, but a few years, not, not decades, not long periods of time. He thinks he's going to live to see it. Every time he mentions the parousia until the very end. Then at the very end in Philippians, he starts talking about, I, I don't know if I'm going to die before or if I'm going to live until the coming of Jesus. But either way, you can't stretch it out for thousands of years. I mean, he never even remotely thought of that. In my opinion, he's very apocalyptic. So he's hoping the guy will come to his senses. You're also to shun him, not even eat with him, he says, and don't even greet him in any way. If you pass him on the street in Corinth, just walk by, act like he doesn't exist. Act like we never have met. That's a Bob Dylan song. He's talking about a girlfriend. <laughs> and he says, uh, I can't understand. She let go of my hand. And she acts like we never have met. <laughs> so uh, that's a good description. Just put the guy out. But what I find really interesting is Paul says, I've already pronounced judgment. I'm not even there. And when you meet... You're just simply carrying out the sentence, you might say, that I have decided. This is his high sense of authority. These are his children. And he often says things like, do you want me to come with a rod and give you a really good thrashing? Or do you want me to come and nurse you like a mother with a child? It's up to you. I can do both. And... Uh, you know, I go through all of those passages in that first chapter. In the book, you also brought up the Edmund Deronka myth from the Sumerian text in which he was taken up to heaven like Enoch and also somewhat like Moses' ascent at Mount Sinai and also Paul's trip to heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 via a vision. Do you think that Paul's vision was influenced from the Old Testament and in turn, the Old Testament was probably influenced 
by the Edmund Duranko myth? I think that uh, it's hard to account for religious experiences, but clearly in every culture they conform to your presuppositions about seven heavens or three heavens or uh, the, the stories that are being told within your culture. So in the case of Paul, we have some pretty rich texts. The life of Adam and Eve is one of the main ones. Uh, segments of the so-called sec second Enoch, Slavonic Enoch, first Enoch, which is an ascent. There, you know, I go through the four kinds of ascent. I'll mention them very briefly here. Uh, and I go through in the second chapter in great detail because there are many examples in the Hellenistic world. It's not just Jewish. But staying with the Jewish ones, one would be ascent as a kind of invasion of heaven. You don't really belong there and you're pretty well told, get the hell back down, you're just immortal, you know. And then you have ascent to get revelation. You're allowed to go, but like Isaiah, you have a heavenly vision or you ascend up or whatever and then you come back down, but you don't belong there. And then there's the ascent at the end of the age that's permanent. Paul says you're going to ascend and meet the Lord in the air and get transformed into this glorified state. So that's the final ascent. But before that, you can make what we call a proleptic trip. Proleptic means to anticipate beforehand. Like what Paul is reporting, we know elsewhere, where you get a taste, a foretaste of what's to come. Like at the end of days, all those in Christ, he says, will be glorified, right? But I was given the privilege of experiencing that before him. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the best parallels is Second Enoch or parts of First Enoch, Ethiopic Enoch. Because when the person comes back, they're never the same again. They have seen the other side. They've looked behind the curtain. They pull the veil. And then they have to come back to this world. And they, uh, in, a, in a small, limited way, it would remind you of some of the near-death experiences that people report where they say this absolutely changed my life. My whole perspective has shifted because of what I saw. So is Paul's experience a near death experience? Well, if your soul or spirit leaves the body and he says, I don't know if it did or not, that's exactly what people report. What induced it? What caused it? He doesn't say that he was in an accident or having surgery or anything like that, the way people do today. But he seems to be aware of something that happened. I don't know if you realize this, Jacob, but I don't think I emphasize it in the book. But this is the only first-person account that we have of proleptic ascent to heaven hmm. from the ancient world. Like we have lots of reports literary accounts, poetic accounts, the magical papyri, Poimandras, the Mithras liturgy, Plato, the myth of Ur, on and on and on, right? Stories. But this is actually a personal letter written by somebody known to us, somewhat by his other seven letters. And he says, uh, I did this. Now, some would say, well, wait, you've skipped over the biggest problem. He didn't say he did. He said, I know a man that did. And I've even had people tell me, somebody put this on Facebook the other day. They said uh, on my Facebook page, which is public, by the way, if anybody is interested. Um, they said, uh, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus ascended to heaven. Uh, but the problem is that, and I cover this in the book, this way of speaking in the third person is known to us in Greek literature. In other words, it's a known rhetorical device. 
it's it's facetious on a certain level. Like if I would say to you, Jacob, I don't want to tell you anything about what I've done. I'm nothing. But I do know someone. And then I start telling you this amazing thing. And you would understand after a few minutes. He's talking about himself. He's doing it in this roundabout way. It's a certain kind of boasting that we know from Greek literature. I give other parallels. So it's definitely him. He's talking about himself. And if you keep reading, it's clear that he's talking about himself because he says, I was given the thorn in the flesh because this was so amazing so that I wouldn't be boasting and thinking that I was the greatest thing alive on planet Earth, you know, and become proud or something like that. So in Paul's view, the biggest problem God has in revealing himself to humans is if he makes you the main guy, a Moses, an Elijah, a Christ, it's going to destroy you because of ego. And I think Paul is in this world in which he believes he is the chosen one the tr really chosen one because Jesus has now gone on to heaven where he's glorified and Paul believes he'll follow. So when you're ready, I'm going to tell you what I think he experienced. I don't know how long you want to go, but probably we should just go a little over an hour. So no, it's fine. Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. Is it just me? What I think, I think that normally Paul believes that when you die, you go to Sheol or Hades, which is the world of the dead, and you wait for the resurrection. That's standard in the Gospel of Luke. Remember the rich man and Lazarus, that story? They're in Hades waiting for the resurrection. And Abraham says to the rich man, even if someone were raised from the dead, your brothers aren't going to believe. So clearly you're, it's the place of the souls waiting. We have that in First Enoch and so forth. And it is called paradise because it's paradise for them. It's what Jesus tells the man on the cross in Luke. I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, you're going to be with the blessed. So that's the normal view. So what are they doing? Yeah, the, Paul's favorite metaphor is sleeping. Uh, we find that throughout the Bible. Daniel 12, those who sleep in the dust. Book of Revelation, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors. So there's this resting period where the dead wait. Now this is pure speculation on my part. I think Paul was told when you die, Paul, you're going to skip that step because he didn't think he's going to die. He, he thought that at the parousia, the coming of Jesus, he would rise with everybody else, right? Everybody together will rise. First Corinthians 4. I, I mean, uh, First Thessalonians 4. And I think he, in Philippians, he indicates that he was told that he would depart and be with Christ directly that he would experience the glorification just like jesus did and not have to wait to the end that's just my speculation because he says i i can't tell you really what i experienced but i think and the parallel to that would be second enoch some passages within first enoch life of adam and eve where the person who has this experience, it, they're never the same afterwards in the sense that they feel they're already almost there in heavenly glory. Remember Moses' face is glowing after he has the revelation as if he's already uh, beginning to become a transcendent being. And I think Paul might have, but I don't know. 
because he said he won't tell us. Um, you know, in all of the mystery religions, and this is a mystery religion, we only have one other person who tells us what they experienced. And uh, since it's a work of fiction, it doesn't qualify for first person. But it's Apuleius, the Greek Roman writer, Apuleius, he writes in Latin. His novel's called The Golden Ass, Donkey, or Metamorphoses. I highly recommend it to everybody. He becomes an initiate of Isis. And he says, I cannot tell you. It's unlawful to tell. Look at the parallel. I can't tell you what I experienced. But I will tell you this, and I'll read it to you. I got the book right here. It's page uh, 157. This is Isis initiation. He said, I approach the boundary of death and treading on Proserpine's threshold, the goddess of Hades and death, I was carried through all the elements. So you went down into the lower world and back up through the heavenly world, after which I returned. So he makes a round trip through the cosmos. He experiences death, ascent to heaven, and comes back down. At the dead of night, I saw the sun flashing brightly, I approach close to the gods above and the gods below and worship them face to face. So this is the only other person or account we have where somebody says, well, what happened in these mystery religions? Like, what do you really experience? And what you experience is cosmic metamorphosis ahead of time, not waiting at the end. You, you somehow experience it all. So if he has paradise in the third heaven, I mean, if he has the dead in the third heaven, which is common, like in Enoch, they're in the third heaven. So he said, I went to the third heaven, and then I went up to paradise. He could well be reflecting a similar experience. But I hasten to say again, I don't know. But if you read Philippians, he seems to be in a different mode. He doesn't know for sure if he's going to live to see the end. And he thinks he might die. And he talks about what he's going to choose. He said, I don't know what to choose. Hmm. What, what would you say is the main differences between the way that Paul theologically describes Jesus and the way the Gospels describe Jesus? Well, the Gospels don't in any way dwell much on the glorification of Jesus as Paul does, other than the so-called transfiguration in Mark 9. And you have that in Mark 9. Matthew, I believe, uses Mark. That's my opinion. Luke uses Mark. And they rewrite it. But Mark 9 is the base text. And there... You do have a Jesus that Paul would recognize, a Moses, Elijah, Jesus then, we, we say transfigured in English, it's just become a standard word, but probably need a new word so people don't yawn when they hear it, like, oh yeah, the transfiguration, yeah, I read that. Now, this is like a mortal <laughs> becoming immortalized and turning into a glorious heavenly being before your eyes. It's blinding. And he says it's like the sun shining in its full strength. So that would be pretty bright, right? And it is a vision. And so the Gospels have that, but that's not their emphasis. It's more on the ethical teachings of Jesus, the Q material and other sayings of Jesus, the parables, and of course, the suffering of Jesus as the suffering servant in Mark 8, 9, 10, and so forth. Paul would have that as well, but he's applying it to himself now, My, his suffering. 
follow me as I follow Christ. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. It's actually the word stigmata, the marks. Uh, he's got his marks from being beaten and whipped and stoned and left for dead and so forth. And but he uh, he and he has the ethics. I, I know he doesn't quote Jesus much, but you know he says love your enemy. He says many of the same things Jesus said. But what he doesn't really, where he really doesn't parallel Jesus is uh, what Jesus is now to him is past that and is the heavenly Christ sitting at the right hand of God. That's his Jesus. Mm. And he says, set your mind on things above, not things below where Christ is seated, seating, seated, at, seating, is seated at the right hand of God. Hmm. So I would say that's the main difference. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of similarities. However, Mark is very influenced by Paul. So I don't know if we're getting Jesus or we're getting Mark's version of Jesus filtered through Paul. Uh, so if I want to recover Jesus, I would tend to go with the sayings and teachings of Jesus and work with that the way many scholars have. Uh, Dale Allison, particularly Dom Crossan, people that have worked a lot on the teachings of Jesus. Paula Fridrickson, these are some of the people I look to. Bart Ehrman, to some degree, has worked on this sort of thing. And to try to find out as much as we can about the less theological Jesus. In other words, the Jesus of history rather than the Christ of faith. Paul is clearly a Christ of faith guy. But that's where he is in history. So that would be the main difference, I think. You also said in the book that Paul uses paradise in a very specific way. And he is lifting from Jewish apocalyptic vocabulary. What is the difference between the way Paul describes paradise versus that of the way the paradise is described in the Gospels and Revelation? Do they also take from Jewish vocabulary, but differently than Paul as well? Yeah, well, paradise is um, essentially the Garden of Eden image, pardes. In Hebrew, it's a loan word in that sense. Um, it means at its bottom line, the ideal immortal state, whether it's in the garden, I should say the garden in Eden, not of Eden. It's actually the garden in Eden. So the garden or at the end in the book of Revelation, as you mentioned, uh, Paradise comes to the earth, and the entire earth becomes paradise. So it's a flexible term that can be in Genesis, it can be in Revelation. Uh, it's not, it's only used once in the Gospels when Jesus tells the, I'm, I'm sorry, twice in Luke, only in Luke, for the state of the dead in Luke. But I guess you could say it has a multivalent function. Right now, it would be the state of the blessed dead because they're in a state of God's protection and keeping and so forth. But in the future, in the world to come, it will be the world to come will become paradise. The key is death will be swallowed up. No more death. And God will be all in all. So Paul believes that he's proleptically experienced that. But it's not that different from some of the other texts I survey in the second chapter. And actually, in the last chapter, I also go back through some of these texts. Hmm. So it's not out of keeping with some of the general usage that we find within these ancient texts, other ancient Jewish texts. Now, later it gets totally 
you know, turned into something like Dante <laughs> or all kinds of uh, things that have to do with the other world. But the New Testament's pretty sparse about what it's really like. Paul's metaphor is sleep. If you're dead, you're okay. You're resting. You're protected. You're with Christ. Don't worry about it. Then you're going to wake up and enter the real thing. So. Final question. You also mentioned that his task is different from Jesus as per Romans 15, 8 to 12. That it was Jesus' ministry that really prepared the way for his own role in bringing about the final events of history. Both Jesus and Paul are servants and agents in the plan as per 1 Corinthians 15, 28. God sent forth his son. He commissions Paul. Jesus' mission was inauguratory, whereas Paul's is culminating, still at root. Paul is theocentric. The beginning and end of God's purpose purposes belong to God alone. Do you think this is involved in Paul claiming to have been crucified in Galatians in some sort of comparison in their ways contrasting from Jesus? Yeah, well, I certainly when he's alive, he's... He's not literally crucified by Roman soldiers or anything like that, right. but he, he sees the act of, just like Jesus said, take up a cross and follow me. He sees the act of uh, giving up the self for suffering and so forth as a similar act. He's telling everybody to do that. You know, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me and so forth. Um, and he talks about his suffering. So that quotation you read is essentially what I went over earlier. And I think a good summary of it would be that Jesus went to this, what he calls the circumcision and fulfilled his uh, portion or aspect of the suffering servant task. And now Paul is going to the nations and likewise fulfilling a similar task. And so um, there are parallels, but they're not parallels that should shock people in that in the gospel traditions, Jesus is already calling upon the community to uh, stand with him, leave everything, suffer and so forth. And Paul expects his community to do that. So he's not the Lone Ranger on this. You know, he says in Romans 8, when he gives his final statement, he says, provided that we suffer with him, we, not just me, that we may be glorified with him. And so he sees his impending death as a, uh, in Philippians, particularly, that he's going to be also giving it all up the way Jesus did. But he expects others to do it as well. But he doesn't think that they've, re he, he's there to exhort them to do it. He's still the head of the pack. You know, he's providing the example. And he says that, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, thanks for joining me once again, uh, Dr. Tabor. Okay, Jack, I'd like, I look forward to it. Yep, and I'd like Enjoy to, uh, yep, and I'd like to uh, have you back at some point in the future. Okay, we'll find some more things to talk about, I'm yep. sure. Okay, take care.